It was New Year's Eve, 1991. My wife and I were walking into Boulder Cave at about 8 or 9 p.m. There was very little snow on the trail, just like a skiff. It was clear, brilliant night. No moon, but with crisp stars and occasional clouds. It was dark, but we had flashlights and warm clothing, and we walked to meet some friends and spend the night at the cave to celebrate New Year's Eve. If you're wondering, we were both sober, having met a few years earlier in AA. Back then, the United States Forest Service wasn't worried about bats, and you could hike into the cave at any time of year. Now, it closes in the fall to preserve some nearly mythical bats that may or may not live in that cave. No one has ever seen these bats except for scientists, and they're probably just pulling our legs. As we made our way up the trail, it was well made, not very steep, winding through the darkened pines. We could hear children's voices in the distance, like a schoolyard or a playground or a yard full of happy children running and yelling and laughing far, far away. At first, we tried to think of what it could be. Maybe someone's in a cabin or people are sitting at Camp Roganuda, but on our way in, we'd seen no cars, tracks, or signs of anyone else in the area. Roganunda was closed down tight and no camps, lights, or fires off in the near distance or by the road. What was a large group of children doing playing out in the distance, up a canyon in the middle of nowhere, in the woods, on New Year's Eve? It makes no sense. It couldn't be sledders, because there's barely any snow, and it was far too late for a little group of kids to be frolicking, unsupervised, in the woods. It was weird, and it didn't make any sense, but we kept hearing it nonetheless. There was an odd, consistent quality to the children laughing noises. They faded in and out of hearing, just on the edge of being there, carried by the wind from a great distance, funneled and shaped by the mountains, trees, and streams, until it found our ears. Then it was back out again, to be lost for a moment, only for it to return. Laughing, yelling, calling, shouting, playing children, faded in and out as we would stop and listen to it until it went away. We walked a few dozen more yards, only to stop and listen again. We said to each other, Do you hear that? Do you actually hear that? And we would wonder to each other what it could possibly be. On and on as we walked up the trail, the children haunted us laughing and screaming and yelling just beyond reason and hearing, like sound waves coming through flames of a campfire, ghost voices traveling on a crisp air night. Anyway, we got up to the cave and told our friends about it, and puzzled together, but forgot about it shortly after while we played our flutes and listened to the New Age music on our boom box with cassette tapes. And then we burned candles, talked philosophy, the mystery and deep meaning around the fire until the wee hours of the morning. It was such a wonderful time. Walking out of the cave, though, something felt like it changed. The woods seemed a bit more ominous. I don't know, maybe we were just tired, but as we made our way down the trail, my wife spots something odd propped up against the base of a tree. It was meant to be found, I think, by us. I believe so. I thought at the time that it's just been left for us by whoever or whatever was making the laughing noises. As an older and more cynical version as I am now, I still believe that it is, or could be, true, though it wasn't certainly the work of children. The object. It was impossible to adequately describe this object. My mind stubbornly refused to remember what it was. I remember the details of its construction and its size and general shape. My wife says that it was a man, a figurine of a human. I have to believe her because when I try to picture it in my mind, it draws a blank. Its construction was like nothing I've ever seen before or since then. 
was a small, abstract figurine, woven of tiny sticks, moss, and pine needles, and lichen. The bear's hair moss had been braided into individual strands into tiny ropes, which woven in and out of bits of lichen and tiny, tiny sticks around some bigger sticks, smaller than the diameter of a pencil. The main framework of small sticks was lashed together with what looked like to be the inner bark of a cedar tree. The spark was then woven into braids and tiny ropes. The workmanship was so intricate, subtle, and bizarre that as we picked it up to look at it, we were just absolutely amazed at first. And then we were a bit shaken. The figurine was unworldly, yet complex and woven and weaved from woodland materials seeming gathered at random with great skill, assembled with patience and practice by tiny, nimble hands. For what purpose? I have no idea. The whole damn thing was weird as fuck. It was easy to dismiss the laughing children as natural phenomena, but the wind, or imaginations, or just some strange, unexplicable happenings that had perfectly logical explanations. The figurine was real, and it wasn't on the trail on the way up to the cave. And no one else had been in the cave while we were there. There's been no cars, no footprints, no additional marks in the snow. There's been nothing. I put it in my pack, and I took it home, and then I kept it for a little while, examining it closely for clues about what? I don't fucking know. The thing was creepy and full of bad magic, and after that, I threw that shit away. Fast forward a little bit, and this incident got filed away in my memory. I gradually forgot about it mostly. However, years later, I got a job working for the Yakima Nation. This job involves a lot of downtime, and my co-workers, who are Yakima, and I would talk about life and stories and such. One day, I casually recounted the series of strange events. And when I got to the part about the laughing children, he snapped his head around and became very alert and acutely interested. He gave me quizzes about everything I detailed, and I recounted the story as I told it here. He was a reticent guy, but he told me point blank that we've run into stick Indians, and explained briefly what stick Indians are. Warning. Do not bring up the subject of stick Indians with Yakima. It is verboten. Trust me, Yakimas don't like to talk about stick Indians. Other tribes have similar stories, and I believe they don't care to discuss them either. It is impolite to bring them up, so don't, please, don't bring up stick Indians. Briefly, the true nature and physical attributes of stick Indians are unknown. No one, to my knowledge, has ever actually encountered a stick Indian and lived to tell the tale. So the myth as I recounted to me, and what little I could read about them online, is that stick Indians are small, vicious, and cunning. Semi-man-like, but they're about three or four feet tall and very skinny. They have elongated arms, legs, and sharp teeth. They have claws on their hands and feet. They also live deep in forests and are occasionally heard, but they're never seen. The laughing that we heard is how they lure their victims out into the forest, where they become disoriented and lost as they attempt to locate these children playing in the woods by themselves. If the victim is an adult, the presumption is that they are attacked and eaten, and whatever remains after the stick Indians fed are never found again. The person becomes permanently lost. If the victim is a small child, the stick Indians turned them into another stick Indian. There's some dark stick Indian magic. This is how they get new recruits. There's so much more to this legend, and much more to say that others have told me since then. But it's getting late, and some things are just best left unsaid. For a long time, I didn't feel like I should carry tales or hazard the risk of upsetting Yakimas or other natives by speaking these things aloud. So, until now, I've kept this mostly to myself. I respect the forest, the mysteries, and the natural world, and the Yakimas, and I honor their beliefs. 
The story of the Stick Indians would just be another mildly interesting tale for me if I hadn't perhaps experienced them myself. As such, I come from a place of privilege with the information I describe here, and I believe that it has been relayed as honestly and accurately as I'm able to recount. Maybe it wasn't real, and maybe you shouldn't believe me. Or maybe there's an explanation for it all that makes sense. But I do know this. As a practical matter, warn your children. Tell them not to follow the sounds of other children playing in the woods. Tell them, if they follow the sounds of children in the distance, they might get lost and never come home. Tell them what could happen to them if they're captured by the stick Indians. That's something we can keep. Just between you and me, for now. Anyways, like other legends and myths and tales, there's a kernel of truth at the center. And some truths are bigger than others. For me, I don't know what to think about what happened to us in the woods. I only know that something did happen to us, and I can't explain it. Hey guys, Dollhouse here. I would like to thank you so much for watching this video, and I'm really sorry that I couldn't make a video last week. I had to turn in an environmental law paper, and it was 20 pages long, and long story short, I got it done. So yeah, it's officially final season, so I have more papers to write. I'm going to try to front load as much content as I can for y'all, just so there isn't a gap in, you know, getting the videos to you guys. So I'm going to do my best over this weekend and over Thanksgiving, like, break to front load as many videos as I can for you. But yeah. If you like this video, please like and subscribe. Tell me what you think about it in the comments, and if you have a preference for a topic, just let me know. I really enjoy hearing from you guys, and if you want me to narrate a story that you have, just send me an email, which is down in the description. Hopefully, within like the next couple days, I'll upload a new video, so, you know, to make up for last week, but... Alright, you guys, until then, have a wonderful weekend, and I'll see you in a few days. Bye for now.